Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for joining me again. I thought uh, today, I'm not long out of bed, um, so I'm going to have a coffee and I hope that you'll join me for, I thought I'd do um, a couple of a couple of Australian short stories because we do have some amazing um, amazing writers here uh, and I don't know whether you want to commit to like more than a short story so I thought well I'll I'll just throw a couple at you um, you can tell me whether they're shit or not. Um, but yes, I really appreciate you being here. Um, I hope you enjoy. And don't mind me if I pause every so often. It's because I'm having a sip of coffee. I really need it. Mm. So, this one is called... Um, and Women Must Weep by Henry Handel Richardson, and it's from 1934. Uh, she was ready at last, the last bow tied, the last strengthening pin in place, and they said to her, Auntie Char and Miss Biddens, to sit down and rest while Auntie Char climbed into her togs. Or you'll be tired before the evening begins. But she could not bring herself to sit for fear of crushing her dress. It was so light and airy. How glad she felt now that she had chosen muslin and not silk as Auntie Char had tried to persuade her. The gossamer-like stuff seemed to float around her as she moved, and the cut of the dress made her look so tall and so different from every day that she hardly re recognised herself in the glass. The girl reflected there, in palest blue, with a wreath of cornflowers in her hair, might have been a stranger. Never had she thought she was so pretty, nor had Auntie and Miss Biddens either, though they all said, said was, well, Dolly, you'll do. And yes, I think she will be a credit to you. Something hot and stinging came up to her throat at this, a kind of gratitude for her pinky white skin, her big blue eyes and fair curly hair and pity for those girls who hadn't got them. Or an auntie char either, to dress them and see that everything was just so. Instead of sitting, she stood very stiff and straight at the window, pretending to watch for the cab, her long white gloves hanging loose over one arm so as to not soil them. But her heart was beating pit-a-pat, for this was her first real grown-up ball. It was to be held in a public hall, and Auntie Char, where she was staying, had bought tickets and was taking her. True, Miss Biddens rather spoilt things at the end by saying, Now mind you, don't forget steps in the waltz. One, two, together, four, five, six. And in the wagonette, with her dress filling one seat, Auntie Char's the other, Auntie said, Now, Dolly, remember not to look too serious, or you'll frighten the gentleman off. But she was only doing it now because of her dress. Cabs were so cramped, the seats so narrow. Alas, in getting out, a little accident happened. She caught the bottom of one of her flounces. 
The skirt was made of nothing else, on the iron step and ripped off the selvage. Auntie Cha said, My dear, how clumsy. She could have cried with vexation. The woman who took their cloaks hunted everywhere, but could only find black cotton. So the torn selvage, there was nearly half a yard of it, had just to be cut off. This left a raw edge, and when they walked into the hall and walked across the enormous, the enormous floor, with people sitting all around staring, it seemed to Dolly as if everyone had their eyes fixed on it. Auntie Charles sat down in, front, in the front row of chairs beside a lady friend, but she, she slid into a chair behind. The first dance was already over and they were hardly seated before partners began to be taken for the second. Shyly she mustered the assembly in the cloakroom, she had expected the women to exclaim, What a pretty sweet frock, when she handed it. When all she did say was, This sort of stuff's bound to fray. And now Dolly saw that the hall was full of lovely dresses, some much, much prettier than hers, which suddenly began to seem rather too plain even a little dowdy. Perhaps after all, it would be so better to choose silk. She wondered if Auntie Cha thought so too, for Auntie suddenly turned and looked at her quite hard and then said snappily, Come, come, child, you mustn't tuck yourself away like that or the gentleman will think you don't want to dance. So she had to come out and sit in the front, show that she had a program by holding it open on her lap. When other ladies were being requested for the third time, still nobody asked to be introduced. Auntie began making signs and beckoning with her head to the master of ceremonies, a funny little fat man with a bright red beard. He waddled across the floor and auntie whispered to him behind her fan, but of course she heard and heard him answer, once a partner, why certainly? And then he went away and they could see him offering her to several gentlemen some pointed to the ladies they were sitting with or standing in front of. Some showed their programs that, were, were the, that these were full. One or two turned their heads and looked at her, but it was no good. So he came back and said, Will the little lady do me the favour? And she had to look glad and say, with pleasure and get up and dance with him. Perhaps she was a little slow about it. At any rate, Auntie Cha made great round eyes at her, but she felt sure everyone would know why he was asking her. It was the Lancers too, and he swung her off her feet at the corners and was comic when he set to, to partners putting one hand on his hip and the other over his head as if he were dancing the hornpipe, and the rest of the set laughed. She was glad when it was over, and she could go back to her place. Auntie Char's lady friend had a son, and he was beckoned to next, and there were more whispering. But he was engaged to be married, and of course preferred to be to dance with his fiancée. When he came and bowed to oblige his mother, he looked quite grumpy and didn't trouble to say all of, may I have the pleasure, but just, 
the pleasure. While she had to say, certainly, and pretend to be very pleased, though she didn't feel it, and really didn't want much to dance with him, knowing he didn't, and that it was only out of charity. Besides, all the time they went around, he was explaining things to the other girl with his eyes, making faces over her head. She saw him quite plainly. After he had brought her back, and Auntie had talked to him again, he went to, the, to a gentleman who hadn't danced at all yet, but just stood looking on. And this one needed a lot of persuasion. He was ugly and lanky, and as soon as they stood up, said quite rudely, I'm no earthly good at this kind of thing, you know. And he wasn't. He trod on her foot and put her out of step, and they got into the most dreadful muddle, right out in the middle of the floor. It was a waltz, and remembering what Miss Biddens had said, she got more and more nervous, and then went wrong herself. And had to say, I do beg your pardon, to which he, he said, granted. She saw them in the mirror as they passed, and her face was red as red. It didn't get cool again either, for she had to go on sitting out, and she felt sure she, he was spreading it, that she couldn't dance. She didn't know whether Auntie Cha had seen her mistakes, but now Auntie sort of went for her. It's no use, Dolly. If you don't do your share, for goodness sake, try and look more agreeable. So after this, in the intervals between the dances, she sat with a stiff little smile gummed to her lips. And did any likely-looking partner approach the corner where they were? This widened till she felt what it was really saying was, Here I am. Oh, please take me. She had several false hopes. Men looking so splendid in their white shirt fronts, would walk across the floor and seem to be coming. And then it was always not her. Their eyes wouldn't stay on her. There she sat, with her false little smile and her eyes fixed on them. But theirs always got away, flitted past, moved on. Once she felt quite sure, ever such a handsome young man looked as if he were making straight for her. She stretched her lips, showing all her teeth. They were very good. And for an instant, his eyes seemed to linger, really take her in, in her pretty blue dress and the cornflowers. And then at the last minute, they ran away. And it wasn't her at all, but a girl sitting three seats further on, one who wasn't even pretty, or her dress either. But her own dress was beginning to get quite trashy from the way she squeezed her hot hands down her lap. Quite the worst part of all was having to go on sitting in front, in the front row, pretending you were enjoying yourself. It was so hard to know what to do with your eyes. There was nothing but the floor for them to look at. If you watched the other couples dancing, they would think you were envying them. At first she made a show of studying her program, but she couldn't go on staring at a program forever. And presently her shame at its emptiness grew, just she could bear it no longer. And seizing a moment when people were dancing, she slipped it down the front of her dress. Now she could say she'd lost it, if anyone asked to see it. But they didn't. They went on dancing with other girls. Oh, these men, who walked around and chose just who they fancied, and left who they didn't. How she hated them. 
it wasn't fair. It just wasn't fair. And when there was a leap year dance, when the ladies invited the gentlemen, and Auntie Cha tried to push her up and make her go, and said, Now then, Dolly, here's your chance. She shook her head hard and dug herself deeper into her seat. She wasn't going to ask them, when they never asked her. So she said, so she said her head ached and she'd rather not. And to this she clung, sitting the while wishing her whole heart that her dress was black and her hair was grey like Auntie Char's. Nobody expected Auntie to dance or thought it shameful if she didn't. She could do and just be as she liked. Yes, tonight she wished she was old, an old, old woman, or that she was safe at home in bed. This dreadful evening, to which she had once counted the days behind her, even as the night wore on, that she was dead. At supper she sat with auntie and the other ladies, and the son and the girl came too. There were lovely cakes and things, but she could not eat them. Her throat was so dry that a sandwich stuck in it and nearly choked her. Perhaps the son felt a little sorry for her, or else his mother had whispered again, for afterwards he said something to the girl and then asked her to dance. They stood up together, but it wasn't a success. Her legs seemed to have forgotten how to jump. Heavy as lead they were, as heavy as she felt inside. And she couldn't think of a thing to say. So now he would put her down as stupid as well. Her only other partner was a boy younger than she was, almost a schoolboy. Who she heard them say was making a nuisance of himself. This was to a very pretty girl called the Belle of the Ball, and he didn't seem to mind how badly he danced with her, for he couldn't take his eyes off the other girl, but went on staring at her all the time, and very fiercely, because she was talking and laughing with somebody else. Besides, he hopped like a grasshopper, and didn't wear gloves, and his hands were hot and sticky. She hadn't come there to dance with little boys. They left before anybody else. There was nothing to stay for, and the drive home in the wagonette, which had to be fetched, they were so early, was dreadful. Auntie Char, Auntie Char just sat and pressed her lips and didn't say a word. She herself kept her face t turned the other way because her mouth was jumping in and out of it as if she might cry. At the sound of the wheels, Miss Biddens came running to the front door with questions and exclamations, dreadfully curious to know why they were back so soon. Dolly fled to her own little room and turned the key in the lock. She wanted only to be alone, quite alone, where nobody could see her, where nobody would ever see her again. But the walls were thin, and she tore off her wreath and ripped open her dress, now crushed to nothing from so much sitting, and threw them from, from her anywhere, anyhow. She could hear the two voices going on, Auntie Char's telling and telling, and winding up at last, quite out loud with, Well, I don't know what it was, but the plain truth is she didn't take. Oh, the shame of it, the sting and the shame. Her first ball, and not to have taken, to have failed to attract the gentleman. This was a slur that would rest on her all her life. And yet, and yet, 
in spite of everything, a small voice that wouldn't be silenced kept on saying, It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. Or at least not except for the one silly mistake in the steps of the waltz. She had tried her hardest, done everything she was told to, had dressed up to please and looked pretty, sat in the front row offering her program, smiled when she didn't feel a bit like smiling, and almost more than anything, she thought she hated the memory of that smile. It was like, it was like trying to make people buy something they didn't think worthwhile. For really, truly, right deep down in her, she hadn't wanted the gentleman any more than they wanted her. She had only had to pretend to. And they showed too plainly they didn't by choosing other girls who were not even pretty and dancing with them and laughing and talking and enjoying them. And now the many slights and humiliations of the evening crowding upon her. The long repressed tears broke through. And with the blanket pulled up over her head, her face driven deep into the pillow, she cried till she could cry no more. me I just have to find the other one that I was going to read uh, this one is called the Queen of Love by Rosie Scott from 1989 It had never occurred to me that I would make old bones, but now that I'm here, at rest with all the years mounted up behind me, it has turned out to be more refreshing than I ever imagined. Here I am, 80 years old, a survivor of the holocausts of this distraught century, being fed and kept warm like a baby, nodding off in my private daydreams whenever the spirit moves me. It is more like a state of grace than anything. There, were, there are few distractions in this friendly house of death, with its scent of daffodils and floor wax, the murmur of television in the drawing room where all the deers, full of mumblings from the past, are staring at the ocean stranded on their seats like old, rumpled seals. I sit in the room watching the days go by and find a shapely pleasure in cataloguing my past desires, going over them in my mind until I am word perfect. I am an ancient librarian holding my dusty photographs up to the light. I have never been the sort of woman who lived through a man, or my children for that matter. Thinking my thoughts has taken up a lot of my time. The great slow tracking of my mind, wheeling through the world, is a happiness I share with no one. Even now I am still the same, but there has been one change which surprised me. Although, like all revelations, it is quite likely I knew about it all along. The memories which keep my bones warm and make me smile are all of lovers dead long. Their beauty and their power of their loving. People would say that this is grotesque, of course, in the ordinary course of events, a grandmother like myself, sitting in this expensive nursing home, paid for by a loving family, would be thinking of religion 
or family or her health. With my straight back, aristocratic face, flyaway hair as soft as duck down, perfumed as I am with talc and baby oil, I am no sex at all. I am simply an object of veneration to my visitors. I receive them with genuine, if absent-minded, love. My great-grandchildren come so dutifully washed and pressed and brushed in my honour, their innocent faces overawed by the purity of age, the serenity of my surroundings. All the time my mind circles lazily around old delights, day after day, hour after hour. But I do not feel any shame, because to me, this state of affairs is not grotesque. If the truth be known, and that is, after all, what I am most interested at in this time of my life, it would be simpler to say that I feel very privileged. Most women I know are only too happy to close their legs and hearts forever against a timeline of men tearing into their soft flesh with or without the invitation. They spend their old age in thankful release, healing up their fearful wounds. All the love and pleasure has been burnt out of their most intimate centres. I, blessed lover that I am, still bathe in the afterglow. My papery skin is still warm from decades of well-placed caresses and consummated delights. And... It seems only natural that I dwell on these past pleasures while I am slipping off into death. Loving was not only a great de delight to me always. I believe now it was the wheel that turned my life over and kept me alive all these long years. There are many other things of importance to me. But sex has always been the deep and delicious undercurrent flowing beneath my life and thoughts, an occupation as real as anything else I did. It seems to me that few humans have done justice to the beauty of it, or even admitted its true spiritual worth as a source of life, a miraculous rejuvenation. This is also, with love, between the same sexes, blessed as it is. Hucksters, pornographers and all religions have trampled and sullied it. The word sex itself, ugly, short and medical as it is, is proof of the common currency of their vinegar-thin views. Even my favourite poet Yeats who wrote some painfully honest poems about sex in his last years, was still ashamed and disgusted at his own late developing raptures. Of course, I am no match for the seedy greatness of those late poems, even in my thoughts, but at least there was never a time when I did not appreciate the beauty of a man, nor did I ever regret any longings or loves. For me, sex is a great richness, a transformation of every facet of existence, a trick of light, the way a man holds his head, a sudden rush of recognition, an ache for all the male beauty forever unattainable. A dance fleshed out by smouldering fantasies, a heartbeat of time, so intense it is almost unbearable wallowing in velvet so soft you can feel each hair brushing against your skin. Even a friendly miscalculation when all the grandeur of it suddenly goes out of kilter and the bumps and pimples of mortal flesh are laid bare to the light in one glorious comical anticlimax. I was never a promiscuous woman, more the reverse, 
because there are only very few men who touched the nerve lying so close to my surfaces. But once they did, there was a permanent change made somewhere in my cell structure, and that was that. It was as if each lover imprinted himself forever. That was the miracle of it to me, the fact that a man, beautiful, moving against my skin like a wild animal, delighting me with his fine arts, could leave his trace, a permanent scent that I could carry through life. Of course, I made false starts, watching men sigh and groan and plead under the spell of a perfumed girl who didn't know any better. But my own intelligence and meeting Mick saved me from all the fabrications of tragic romance and coy falsities in one clean blast, and the two of us looked set for eternity. My body has always responded only to certain cues, very precise and divine indications of magic. These qualities in men, which stirred me most deeply, are difficult to describe. It is like trying to dissect a butterfly. But I know them by heart. There is nearly always brown hair, curls, an ebullience matched with grace, a face both scornful and tender, qualities of self-containment, intelligence, a dry wit, courage. A solid body with that bloom to the skin, competent hands, a touch of hardness, street wisdom. I knew that rare mixture whenever I saw it. And for all my breeding and background, it was rarely gentlemen who set my heart beating. Hooligans, working men, were the ones that had that irresistible flesh, that experience of life that they walked past me like war warriors. My beloved Mick had all these virtues and more, and so I was prepared to give up my class, my status, my family if need be, to have him. It didn't have to come to that, of course, my parents being too good as judges of character and untainted by the curse of snobbery. I can still see him now, the day we met. He had a strong body, hair curling down his neck. He spoke in a quiet voice. He was brown from the sun, his pants work stained, his larrikin eyes alight when he caught sight of me. You could see that he wasn't slow, his face alive with considering as he noticed my best white dress and my hair hanging down my back. The instant we met and looked at each other, I wanted him in my bed. Eighteen and virgin as I was, I knew instinctively what sort of power lay in the big, quiet body as he stood there in my father's yard. In our wedding photo, he looked sly and merry and knowing. There was nothing of the shrinking violet about either of us. For all the world, as my eldest once said, as if we couldn't wait. There was that powerful stance of his, his tender eyes brimming with vitality. And as for me, I showed none of the child bride's usual shyness. I was smiling and every inch of me was willing. Young as we were, we were full of the pleasures of our new station. There was nothing misleading about our innocent lust either, for we were equally matched as it turned out although we both had our low times. The tension and the troubles that came between us were just more fuel for our nighttime fires. And towards the end, when we were both more peaceful with one another, we knew, luxuriously, 
that even with all the joy and tumult of the world raging past us, we could always have each other. He would come home from work with that soft bloom of dust and weariness on him, so tired he could hardly speak, but he seemed to grow sustenance from me. His eyes lit up so beautifully when he saw me that he glowed and looked startling alive. I would kiss my beautiful husband, sit on his warm thigh, his delicious mouth on my neck, ride astride his knee, leaving a round secret moisture there, glistening like a kiss. That was our private joy, the eroticism of married life, our license for the unlimited pleasure of monogamy. While the children were sleeping like little dolls in their dark beds, mouths open, dreaming of galloping horses, we had our own supple fantasies. We were lost in our own trance. In the dark, when he was above me, his shoulders gleaming in the shadows, breath rasping on my neck as his hard, warm body moved against me. His eyes closed with the sweetness of it, damp curls on his neck, smelling of clean sweat. I knew that that was my mortality, my religion, the secret engine which pulled me through the world. After he died, no one could come near me for years. It wasn't as if I was living in Perda out of convention or necessity either, because there were plenty of suitors. It was simply a physical imperative. I could not let another man touch my skin. When it finally happened and I met someone, he was so unsuitable that even my dear children were scandalised. I was a disgrace, an embarrassment, because, of course, that was in the dead fifties, when women sleepwalked through their days in those icy uplift bras and frilly aprons, while children lived their lives as bland as buttons, with no one to give them an underview. Neither of us was interested in love at that time of our lives, but there was his white white skin, his decadent mouth, that sly look from under his eyelids, which went straight to the hair at the back of my neck. Pat was a young adventurer, full of grace and ease in himself. He took his time over everything, shrewd, so that his lovely attentions lasted for hours. Our fantasies meshed the day that we met. He, a builder's labourer, in work pants and bare white chest, tattooed. Me, an older woman, barefoot, perfumed, scarlet nails, moving slowly with the heavy summer afternoon. After the first time, I remembered vividly, vividly how he lay back on his pillows like a lord, his eyes narrowed against the smoke of his cigarette and he gave me that lazy half-smile of total well-being. Lying there, his pale body glimmering in the shadow, looking at me with his hooded blue Irish eyes, lovely as an angel. That was something. It was nourishment after all my days of loneliness. Our love-making was slow and creamy and relentless. There were times of intensity, drowning in the sheets after long afternoons. He would always want more. Pirate that he was, with that smile of his, his expert hand stroking me, unwilling at first, back into delirium. When he left our town, I was sad, but not shattered, for unlike the breakup of many love, love affairs I'd seen, 
There were no sour memories or recriminations. There were images I kept in my mind's eye. His mouth, swollen after I'd kissed it. A certain spicy smell of male sweat, dust, apple-scented soap. The supple line of his white back as he bent over in the half-light to undress me. And of course, there was my next lover. Blonde, troubled, closed. Infinitely attractive to women with his elegance and sombre blue eyes. An actor, very clever, always full of little calculations. He was a lost soul as well, a male siren. A cruel despot who taught all the women in his life lethal games. Our time together went smoothly as cream on the surface, with the money, theatre, parties, my job as tutor at the university. But all the time, there was this deadly subterranean river flowing between us. <coughs> I was always on the edge of drowning in it, in the aching sweetness of total submission to him. And its twin, rage at my self-annihilation. I remember nights when I was so slippery wet, he could not hold me. He called me his child, his pet, but I could not whis I could not answer, my mouth was so dry after our perverse games. He would whisper all his mockeries and commands softly in my ear as we made love. Tell me about his other woman in that deep cultured voice of his, and always, whatever he did, I was his whenever he wanted me. Weeping liquid open in his arms. I was his beautiful assured woman during the day and at night a begging waif, his own creation, enmeshed in his ferocious needs. The voluptuousness of loving like that strung me out to an impossible pitch and I became heartsick, a fool, my energies drained. I was a grandmother by then and could have been living in peace instead of chasing this man, undignified, my clothes too young, my face anxious at all the sugary parties we went to. When he took up with a younger woman and began to teach her all his little scorching tricks, I was sick with desire. I tried to lure him back to compete with that lovely smiling girl, pleading with him to kiss me, even when her scent was still fresh on his skin. Then one humiliating night, I knew I had had enough. It was as if I closed off from this whole new frequency he'd tuned me into. And those sounds of distress, ecstasy and disgust ceased entirely. No one has ever talked to me about deep and private places like this in their lives. There is something too aching and ruttish about such behaviour for comfort. But I have a feeling that most people have experienced that hot shiver at, at some time. A sensation occasionally more delicious, certainly more terrible than simply loving. He was a dark angel, this man with his magnificent obsession with power and cruelty, his only means of showing love. It would be boorish of me not to say false, to deny his gifts, the exquisite pain and pleasure he provided, and the dangerous territories he took me across. But I am glad I emerged safe, with only a few tender spots to keep me company when I have need of a little stimulant. Now that I am old, I can say this about myself with just enough kindness and irony to keep it in perspective. My second husband was pure sunshine after those dank delights. He was a giant of a fellow, huge, woolly, talented, kind, a comely man. 
We had no need of passion after our respective roller coaster lifetimes. The sensual seep of our enjoyment together was more subtle and slower, like luxuriate, luxuriating in a still warm pond. I have such a loving memory of the two of us walking everywhere hand in hand. We were like those moth eaten lions you see basking at the zoo. They were way past their prime, too experienced to make any unnecessary movement, but they are still observing the world closely from their sleepy slits of their wicked yellow eyes. We gave each other comfort and dignity and all the kindness we had. When he died, I believed my time was up as well, that I had had enough love to last me for the rest of my days. Thus it is that the wheel keeps turning in our lives. It still seems strange to me that I am sitting here, an old woman, dreaming of these past loves, my limbs once so tender, now weighed down by age and infirmity. But there is no real end to things, another discovery I have made recently. Even now, sometimes I still catch myself thinking like a young girl. As I lie in my single monastic bed in the nursing home, my old heart beating strongly in my breast, I dream of pleasures that might still be, and then the power of love is in me like a fire, leaping out and lighting up the world. Thank you everybody for listening and I hope you enjoyed. Um, tune in tomorrow. Much love. <laughs>